I had the opportunity to visit Canberra for the Treasures of Versailles exhibition in February. And as part of my research, I found out about the Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex, which is part of NASA's Deep Space Network. Naturally, being a space geek, I got in touch with them and visited the complex on the 20th of February 2017. Hi, I'm Enoch Ko, and I'm standing right in front of the Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex, uh, and I'm here to see Glenn Nagel, who's going to show me around this complex. Hi Enoch, how are you? Hi. Welcome to the Deep Space Complex. Uh, great chance today, wonderful day to be able to show you a little bit more about who we are and what we do here out in the Tibbin Villa Valley outside of Canberra. Important for security, need you to wear one of our visitor badges and we'll head inside. All right, thanks. Before we go any further, let's begin by understanding what is the Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex and what it does. The Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex, it's a part of NASA's Deep Space Network. So this is one of only three stations in the world that has this important task, and that's to provide all the communications to the dozens of spacecraft that are out there exploring the solar system, visiting planets and moons and asteroids and comets, and looking deep into space at other stars and galaxies. So our job every day is to communicate with those spacecraft. We send commands to them, we tell them where to go and what to do, what not to crash into more importantly, unless the scientist wants to actually crash into it, and what information to collect and then send back home. We get all the information in, we process it, we send it off to thousands of scientists around the world so they can tell us a little bit more about what they're learning about space, the universe around us. Of course, we also share it live with everybody else on the internet. All the pictures and data ends up on the web somewhere so people can check out the latest pictures from Mars or Saturn or wherever we happen to be exploring. The Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex is located in the Tibbinbilla Valley, about 20 kilometers southwest of Canberra City. It takes about 45 minutes to drive from the city center to the complex, so it isn't exactly the most accessible location. That begs the question, why did NASA choose to build a deep space communications complex at Timbinbilla? So to have an effective deep space network, you need three sites around the world, separated by about one third of the planet each. So as Earth turns, there's always one station watching every part of the solar system 24 hours a day. NASA had their first station already built in Goldstone, California. It was handling some of the early US space probes. So they looked a third of the world either side. One line ran down through parts of Europe and into Africa, and originally they were thinking about building a southern hemisphere site in South Africa, but that was not sort of politically expedient during the 1960s. So they ended up building that other station in Spain, and they looked a third of the world on the other side. That ran down in the Australian Eastern Seaboard. So it ended up looking at the coastal cities. They were always going to get too big. Their populations would grow and encroach on a station like this, which needs its radio quietness. So they looked to Canberra, and Canberra, big enough to support it with personnel and services, it had nice wide open valleys like this one, excellent field of view of sky, but good low-lying hills, so the hills do an, an important thing, and that's to shield us from all that sight, line of sight noise coming from radios, televisions, and mobile phones. And back here in the 1960s, very few sheep had mobile phones at that time, so it ended up being a perfect spot, a nice stable area, granite base, Good to build big structures like these, good field of view to the sky, radio quiet, perfect spot, and it continues to be a great spot to do our communication work with all those spacecraft out there. In recent years, NASA has been building a new type of radio telescope as part of the Deep Space Network Aperture Enhancement Project, and had the opportunity to visit one of them for myself. Thanks, Len, for catching up with me here. Um, can you tell me a bit about this telescope we're standing in front of? Yeah, this is Deep Space Station 36. It's the newest antenna to come into operation here on site in October 2016. Mm. And it's a little bit different to the other dishes here on site. It's what we refer to as a beam waveguide antenna. Mm -hmm. The other dishes here on site have their transmitter receiver systems actually inside the dish itself. Mm -hmm. But for this generation of antennas, all of that is actually underground. And you can see this little rampway going down underneath mm -hmm. here. What that does for us is it isolates the electronics, the transmitter and receiver systems, because the thing that's kind of our enemy here is radio noise. Mm -hmm. So all that noise created by radios, televisions, mobile phones, that actually interferes with what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. You know, if your, say, mobile phone was sitting on Pluto, it'd be the strongest radio source in the sky. So this is why we ask when people come into the valley to turn off their devices, keep mm -hmm. the valley as radio quiet as possible. Mm -hmm. Because the signals we're trying to receive are like 20 
billion times weaker mm -hmm. than the power generated by a watch battery. So it's literally a whisper from space. So mm -hmm. having electronics actually underground, located in a, a cylinder about two stories deep underneath the dish, mm -hmm. that sort of protects it a little bit more from that radio noise. It does mm -hmm. a couple of other things for us too. It actually makes the dishes lighter. Without the equipment actually up in there, that means you can move the antenna a little bit more easily, less wear and tear on the drive system, so it actually reduces your maintenance effort you've got to do. It means you don't have to sort of haul delicate equipment up to height using cranes. You know, there's always the chance of dropping something, don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And it also means you don't have to have people going up into the dish as often to do that maintenance work. They can do that all nice and safely underground. So the beam wave guides, they're going to be the way to go with all of our dishes. And we currently have three on site. We mm -hmm. hope to build maybe one or two more over the next decade or so. Unlike the common optical telescopes that we have seen or own at home, these radio telescopes have the ability to do two-way communication. That means they don't just receive signals coming from the spacecrafts out there in the solar system, they can also broadcast signals to those spacecrafts. How does this, uh, the telescopes actually receive and send signals? So yeah, the antennas are transmitters and receivers. When we're receiving signals from a spacecraft, it's just a radio wave. We all use radio waves all the time. Our phones use radio waves, our televisions, our radios, all using radio waves. So a coded signal coming in from space. That comes in, bounces off the dish surface, and these are these aluminium panels, a big parabolic dish, so that then reflects that signal up to the sub-reflector, secondary receiver at the top of the antenna. That then focuses the signal down through the centre of the dish. And on these dishes, of course, unlike the other dishes which have the receiver system in the, current, in the actual dish, this goes down through a hole in the middle of the dish, mm -hmm. and then comes down through this pipe arrangement you can see in the middle of the antenna there. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a periscope, comes down through there, bouncing the signal off a series of metal mirrors. That then goes into the receivers actually underground, and the receivers themselves are just big sort of horns, they're big long cones mm -hmm. that are designed to be at a specific size, particular design to pick up a particular frequency from a spacecraft. So that signal goes in there, collects, concentrates, gets turned from a radio signal to electronic signal, that gets sent through processors to our main operations building through our computer systems and then immediately off to NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs mm -hmm. in California. They then do a, another step of processing, that's to take the stream of signal and cut that back into packets of information, whether it's the picture data or uh, telemetry coming from the spacecraft about the uh, status of equipment on board, or it might be from the other instruments that are taking other observations of different things out there. And then all of that goes off to the scientists who can be located anywhere in the world. So we, a good way to think about us is being like the post office for space. You know, the spacecraft is sending a nice uh, package of information, it's got some pictures in there, a few postcards. We get that, we sort it out from the junk mail, all that noise generated by the rest of space and by Earth itself, and we get that cleaned off signal off to JPL and then off to the scientists so they can learn a little bit more about the universe. When we go the other way, of course, the scientists then want their spacecraft to do something, so they sort of write a program, send that to JPL, JPL sends it to us, we transmit it to the spacecraft at the appointed time. So again, it does the reverse from the receive, goes out through the transmitter horn, goes up through that tube, out into space, and it travels off at the speed of light to that little spacecraft, wherever it happens to be in the solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, and since we're talking about spacecraft, anywhere in the solar system, what's the furthest spacecraft that we can reach from these telescopes? So right now, the most distant spacecraft are the twin voyages. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. They've been out there for nearly 40 years now. Uh, they, of course, did the big exploration, the grand tour of the solar system during the 1980s. They went to Jupiter, they went to Saturn. Voyager 2 continued on, went to Uranus and Neptune, the only spacecraft to visit those two distant worlds. Since then, the two voyages have just kept going. So Voyager 1 is heading northward out of the solar system, Voyager 2 is heading southward. So we can see them from here in Canberra, where they happen to be. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our station is the only one that can communicate with Voyager 2 now. It's so far oh. south out of the solar system that the planet actually blocks the view of the Northern Hemisphere stations. They can't see it now. And uh, Voyager 1 right now is the most distant of those two craft. It's uh, 20.8 billion kilometres away and continuing to move away from us at about 1.4 million kilometres every day. So wow. it's way out there. Okay. Um, when we communicate with it, of course our signals travelling at the speed of light. For Voyager 1, it takes around about 18 and a half hours just for the signal to get to the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a long way out there. Mm -hmm. 
While NASA and the European Space Agency have missions all across the solar system, Mars missions remain the most popular. Personally, I remember the excitement watching the live stream of NASA's Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity landing on Mars. And before the landing, NASA published a video called 7 Minutes of Terror, which I'll link up here in the description below. Um, if you haven't seen the video, I highly recommend it. So at the present time, we have over 40 missions out across the solar system. They represent more than 20 countries around the world that are exploring space. But the one location in our solar system that's getting the most attention right now is the planet Mars. Eight spacecraft there currently, six in orbit, two rover rovers operating on the surface. So we tend to think of Mars as being the traffic jam of the solar system. There's a lot going on there. And many more missions plan to go over there for the next few years. Lots of countries wanting to know a little bit more about the red planet. And it's a place that really intrigues us because it's a world that in its past was very similar to Earth in a lot of ways. It had rivers and lakes and oceans and salty seas, a, probably a thicker, oxygen-rich atmosphere. So it's a world that has the possibility that it may have once supported life or even that life could still be there today if it ever existed. So we want to learn a little bit more about that planet. So uh, we have spacecraft like uh, MAVEN, Mars Express, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Mars Odyssey, and also India's mission, the Mars Orbiter mission, MOM, currently in orbit around Mars. And the two rovers operating, uh, the rovers, Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity, and the Mars Science Laboratory Rover Curiosity. Now, Curiosity's been there for four and a half years now, doing a great job, traveled well over 10 kilometers exploring the planet across what was an area on Mars that was once a massive lake inside a giant crater. So that's a, that's a water-rich environment, could have easily been a place for life. And Rover Opportunity, which along with its rover sister, Spirit, landed on Mars in 2004 on what was to be a 90-day mission, maybe travel 600 meters, and maybe study a few dozen things on the surface. Well, Rover Spirit operated for nearly seven years on the planet and traveled many, many kilometers, climbed mountains, went in to explore wonderful, interesting valleys that had evidence of ancient hot springs and volcanic vents there. Rover Opportunity is still going 13 years after it landed on the planet, way past that 90-day warranty. has traveled more than 44 kilometers, climbed mountains into deep valleys, explored giant craters. It's done more than anybody I think could possibly imagine, and it's still going strong. So we've got all these great missions out there, and it's our job every day. Get those commands there, get all that data back to keep a lot of Mars scientists, keep their anxiety levels a little bit lower. As I described previously in the Mars and Venus video, Mars takes about two years to orbit the Sun. So that means that if Earth and Mars stop at the same point in the orbit, in one year's time, Earth will have returned to the same position, while Mars will be on the opposite side of the Sun. So that presents some communication challenges when scientists are trying to control the rovers and spacecrafts operating on Mars. So of course the solar system is constantly moving. We have the Earth orbiting around and all the planets orbiting around, and there are times when these worlds go into what we call conjunction. So this is when Mars is on one side of the Sun, Earth is on the other. Sun's blocking our communication field of view with those radio signals. So what missions do, and it's usually a sort of a two week period roughly when that conjunction happens, just the dance of our planets around the Sun. And so they have to put the spacecraft into kind of an automatic mode, maybe taking just simple observations, uh, doing sky studies with the Mars rovers, say, or to do a, a long integration with one of the mass spectrometers on the Mars rover to analyze a piece of rock or soil. So not doing a lot of work in that time, but doing a little bit every single day, filling up the recorders so that when it does come back with Mars into our field of view, we can get all that information back again. The orbiters, of course, they continue their observational work as well, learning more about the atmosphere of the planet and a little bit more about the geology, and they can collect information just in an automatic mode. Right now, there's all robots on Mars, uh, but uh, what does the, the Deep Space Network and what kind of role will camera play in the future of uh, space exploration as humans go, go beyond the low Earth orbit, go into the Moon and the Mars? Into Mars? Well, of course, the Deep Space Network sort of started out originally doing the earliest robotic missions, and then we did support those first journeys to the Moon with all the Apollo astronauts during the 60s and early 70s. We've then continued to track all the robotic spacecraft, but we're getting back into the human spaceflight business. 
at the moment. We're right in the midst of building a brand new control room here on site, additional consoles. We'll be able to run not only our station here, but the other stations in the Deep Space Network as well. And this is to all get the Deep Space Network ready to support those first journeys back to the moon, perhaps in the early 2020s, and then eventually a journey of a half a billion kilometres, taking maybe 10 months to get all the way to the planet Mars. At the moment, NASA and other space agencies and some private corporations have made no secret that they want to get humans to Mars sometime in the 2020s and into the early to mid 2030s. It'll all depend on, on budgets, on political will of course, but we're already preparing for it regardless of when it happens. It could happen five years from now, it could happen 10 years, 20 years from now. The Deep Space Network will be ready to provide that vital link to those astronauts taking that next one giant leap for humanity on the surface of the red planet Mars. So, um, can you talk, tell me a little bit about uh, how does the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex operate? So we operate as part of NASA's Deep Space Network, the three stations around the world. And this is a government-to-government -government treaty arrangement between Australia and the United States to work together in the exploration of space. This is an arrangement that started in the early 1960s. And here in Australia, to look after the station on NASA's behalf, the Australian government gives us that responsibility to our chief scientific organisation, the CSIRO, who manage a great team of people here, that's just about 90 people who work for the complex, so we're all CSIRO employees. But importantly, the station is actually all paid for by NASA. It's from their budget that looks after the daily operations of the site, all the work we do. Pays all the people that work here, pays our electricity bill and our land rates and all of the contractors, anybody else we use to help us maintain and operate the facility 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and uh, what, what kind of research operates uh, do you conduct here? Uh, beyond helping NASA communicate with those space friends. So we don't have to do any of the, the science research, any of the data we get back. That goes off to science teams who are all over the planet, mainly based at various universities on Earth. Uh, the work that we do in our research is actually trying to advance the technology of space communications. Always got people here coming up with new ways, new techniques of doing things. Actually, we help to write the manuals that actually train everybody else in our network around the world for actually how to do this sort of stuff, how to operate the antennas, how to do the communications, handle emergencies. So we play that sort of important teaching role. But throughout our network, our three stations here, Spain and California, all of our people work at those sites. We work as one big team coming up with new ideas, new processes. Anybody that comes up with a better way of doing something, they'll share that out to the other stations so that we can do our job far better for those scientists who are doing the really important job, and that's exploring the solar system and beyond. So, so can you tell me a bit about uh, the staff you have on site here? So we have 90 people that work for us currently. They're great engineers, technicians, spacecraft communication people. These are people with skills in mechanical engineering, structural engineering, electronics, hydraulics, uh, transmitter systems, receiver systems. Uh, all the computer processing systems, uh, we have IT specialists, computer programmers, people work with our atomic timing systems, so they have sort of physics backgrounds looking after those systems. Uh, everybody we need in, in administration, logistics, and just the, the maintenance people, cooks, gardeners, cleaners, uh, little people like me doing this job every day so that we can operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's all those professional skills that we have to maintain all the operations so that we can keep those contact with the spacecraft out there. And uh, where do these people come from? So we have people from all over Australia. They're an all Aussie team that works here. There's a, there's a couple of New Zealanders, there's somebody from Britain, but they're all local residents. Mm. And we actually just commute out in and out each day. So many of the people that work here have worked here for a long time. I've been here 15 years and I'm still relatively new. Uh, we have people who've worked here for 20, 25, 30, 40 years in some cases who have built up incredible expertise which they pass on to the next generation coming through. So uh, great people from all over the country who have great attitude and aptitude in their particular fields. 
And if there's anyone who's interested in coming to work uh, for NASA and for Canberra, Canberra uh, Deep Space Communications Complex, um, how can they find a job here? Yeah, so we do advertise when positions come up, although as I said, we retain people for a long, long time, but we're always bringing new apprentices in. We want to keep teaching a new generation so that eventually we can all retire. Uh, we have um, an industry-based learning program that we do as well. So. What we do is we approach varying universities and we uh, say to them, okay, we have a few positions open. It might be a position in engineering, it might be an IT specialist area. And then quite often we're bringing in first year students and we bring them in, we pay them a full wage, we employ them for 12 months here and they'll learn more here than often than they might learn in a four year course at university. And when they leave here, they've picked up enormous amounts of skill sets. Uh, they have worked in a real working environment, which is really great for an ongoing career. And the money they've earned, of course, will probably cover all of their education costs ongoing. So we think that's a, an important investment in the next generation. So that they might not come and work for us, they might end up working somewhere else. But I think any of the industry-based learning students we've had here over the years uh, I've really enjoyed the experience and being part of the job that we do every day, which for us, we kind of think of our job as making history, exploring all those worlds out there, helping to get that data of places nobody's ever been to before, see things they've never, you know, never seen before. So allowing students to be a part of that is very important to us and all the apprentices and everybody else that work here get to enjoy that as well. So that was the Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex. A big thanks goes out to Glenn Nagel, NASA, and the CSIRO for supporting me in making this video. And if you have more questions about the Deep Space Complex, I'll include links to their website and Twitter in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And be sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of my future videos. And I hope to see you in my next video.